Thank you so much for the introduction, Jordan. It was like my whole talk <laughs> condensed <laughs> into three minutes. Um, no, thank you so much for coming here tonight, and uh, a big thank you to the JCC for having us here tonight as well. That's Adam. <laughs> he's, he's now leaving. <laughs> um, no, so <clears throat> I've written this book, the Nordic Baking Book, and it's uh, the end of a six-year process uh, that after three years resulted in the Nordic Cookbook and now finishes with this book. And it's been incredibly interesting for me as a, as a Swedish person, a person living in the Nordics, to get to spend this much time learning about my own culture. A culture that I thought I knew a lot about and it turned out that I didn't know uh, as much about at all as I thought in the beginning. Um, and the purpose of these two books, it's really to try to explain to uh, the world what Nordic food culture and baking culture looks like today. Because I think that the culture of eating and baking in my home region is one of the most misunderstood uh, cultures in the whole world. And it's largely my own fault. I mean, if you type Nordic cooking into Google, uh, you will get first like a thousand articles about Noma, Faviken, and like four other restaurants. <laughs> and, and none of them are very uh, representative of how we actually eat in the Nordics. And then after that, you'll get uh, a bunch of recipes for gravlax, meatballs, pickled herring, and cinnamon buns. <laughs> And they're all great and they're all Nordic, but that's not what we eat every day either. And then lastly, if you picture Google, you will get like a lot of, like a lot of people um, photographing their meatball portion from Ikea, <laughs> which is kind of great. Now, so I felt that there, there is a real need for these books. And uh, uh, something that I've learned during the uh, second half of this process, working on the baking part of the project, is that there is just so much more diversity in the region than I would, have, than I would ever, have, ever have expected. Uh, and I've actually come to uh, the conclusion that there is no greater and more diverse baking culture on the planet today. And this might sound a little bit less than obvious to most people, and uh, I'm going to try to spend like the next 30 minutes or so making my case to why this is true. And then uh, me and Adam are going to talk a little bit, and then we're going to open up to some questions with you guys, if, if there are any. Um, the best place to start when you talk about culture, it's the people. Because without people, there is no culture, baking or other. And the Nordic region, it's inhabited by about 26 million people, and they're spread out over a surface area of just under 3.5 million uh, square kilometers. This means an average of seven and a half person per square kilometer. And this is, I mean, by no stretch they can, this can be uh, uh, characterized as particularly densely populated, right? Uh, we can compare it to the whole rest of Europe without the Nordics, which would in the same way have 90 people per square kilometer, a lot more. Uh, and it gets even more interesting when you get into the separate countries. Uh, France, 116 people per square kilometer. And then Germany, the most populous na nation in Europe, 237 people per square kilometer. So if you take all of the Germans and you spread them out <laughs> in an even layer all across their country, you get one German per 75 meters in every direction. Uh, if you do the same in the Nordic region, you have 375 meters between all of us. It's a huge difference. Uh, so we have this vast geographical area with a very scarce population. And I mean, if we were to go back, let's say a couple of hundred years to a time when a lot of what we would consider our cultural identity of today was actually founded, what do you guys think that's, that this sort of uh, scarcity of population uh, would have meant for the way that knowledge is transmitted between people? Can I get some suggestions? Infrequent. Infrequent. <laughs> really, really difficult. Really difficult, yeah. I think that sort of sums it up pretty well, actually. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this is obviously pre-television and cell phones and social media and everything. Uh, and I think that 
I mean, information everywhere was simply transmitted at a much lower pace back then than it is today. You essentially, you had to just talk to someone in person, face to face, to acquire whatever information they might have that you were interested in, or you had to like write the letter. <laughs> and that's, you know, I love letters, but it's a very, very slow way of exchanging information, <laughs> not very efficient. And the third possibility, if you wanted to learn from a trusted source about, for example, baking, I mean, it was to, uh, to read a book. And back then there were like three books, uh, the Bible, and then two more, which was not on baking at all. <laughs> so, I mean, if we can kind of agree that information would have flowed uh, a lot slower everywhere because of the lack of technology, I think we can also very easily imagine that in an area as scarcely populated as the Nordic region, this effect would have been even further exaggerated, simply because it's just you know, harder to get face to face with people. And this is very important for my reasoning and something that I'm going to get back to a little bit later. And now I'm going to do an example to illustrate this. Adam. So, Tomorrow, Adam uh, is going to invent a new recipe for cake. And it's not just any cake, it's actually the most delicious cake that's ever been invented by humankind. <laughs> Revolutionary, very delicious. Um, and I mean, he'll bake it. He will have a little taste himself. He will feel very content about his new cake because it is very delicious. He uh, will share it with his family. They are going to be really happy to eat it because it is very delicious. And what people do today when they feel a sense of accomplishment is to share this information, usually by social media. So chances are that Adam is going to post about his new cake recipe on his uh, Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or whatever. Uh, and the information is going to reach a few more. You know, and I mean, he's a trusted source. So uh, his claim that this is the most delicious cake ever invented by humankind, it's probably going to lead to at least a few people being intrigued enough to actually ask him for the recipe. And they're going to bake it. And they're also going to be really happy because the cake is very delicious. And they're also going to share it. And all of a sudden, you're going to you know, continue this sort of uh, generations of sharing uh, the recipe for this new and revolutionary cake. And then maybe you hit someone that has uh, a little bit more reach, and you reach more people, and more people, and more people. And all of a sudden, it's featured on Martha Stewart Living, Adam's <laughs> cake. And, and then, um, the, the end of this month, end of November, is my birthday. And back home in Sweden, Tove, my wife, she's making a birthday cake. But it's not the normal birthday cake, not the uh, green marzipan layer cake, the princess cake, which is my favorite birthday cake. No, no, it's a new recipe. But it's actually not Adam's recipe. No, it's the vegan raw food version of Adam's recipe <laughs> that, that Tove got from her Goop newsletter. And I mean, that's sort of how it works today, you know? Uh, so within just a couple of weeks, uh, a new piece of information about, let's say, baking culture can reach pretty much all across the globe. It can reach an enormous amount of people, and it also mutates really quickly along the way into new versions and iterations of itself. And if we were to compare this to how it used to be back in the old days, I mean, at the, the Saks homestead, um, the, the same cake it would have been invented, the same sense of uh, satisfaction and accomplishment, it would have been shared with the family, and, you know, that would have been it for a while. Uh, pretty much until perhaps uh, Adam's kids would have left home and, you know, gotten married with uh, someone on the next homestead, 800 meters away, um, <laughs> 20 years later. So, uh, you know, after a significantly longer amount of time, the revolutionary cake recipe, the uh, mother of all cakes, would have reached, you know, uh, eight people in... <laughs> a diameter of two kilometers, roughly. And this is over, obviously a bit of an over-exaggeration, but I think you get the point. I mean. uh, and to put this uh, simply, a uh, scarce population spread out over a vast area used to mean, and to some extent still does mean, that knowledge travels slower. And the, this, in its turn, it will mean that you'll get much more varied expressions of all commonly practiced culture. 
simply because people are less influenced by each other, and therefore they do less of the same stuff. And this is one reason to why the Nordic region has a much more diverse bacon culture than anywhere else. Another reason, which is also somewhat related to the uh, scarcity of population and which uh, really influences the baking culture, it's uh, the role of bakeries in society. And in the Nordics, baking culture, it's not carried primarily by bakeries, but rather by people in their homes. Not just in the past, but also today. And I mean, why do you guys think this is? What does bakery needs to sustain themselves? Customers. They need customers. <laughs> And I mean, as I said before, we have on average one every 375th meter. So there are not so many. And I mean, there are definitely bakers in the Nordics, but mostly they are in the cities. And uh, the cities are few and far apart. And they're mostly located in quite a small part of the region. Uh, it would be sort of uh, the sort of southern third of Sweden, uh, the country of Denmark, a little bit in the uh, southwest of Finland, around Helsinki and up the coast, and then it would be around Oslo and a bit up the coast of Norway. That would have been where you would have had significant enough populations to sustain bakeries in sort of more historical times. I actually did a little test. <laughs> uh, a few weeks ago, I was talking on a completely different subject, so I didn't influence the audience. Uh, and I asked them, I knew that I was going to do this, so I asked them a little question. Um, and that question was what they thought was the greatest baking culture on the planet. So what do you think they said? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they didn't say Nordic. None of them said Nordic. And, <laughs> Which was shocking, you know. Uh, no, and I mean, there were there were a hundred of them in the room. Um, it was 99 of them said France, and then there was this one guy who said Austria. Uh, and and it kind of made me think a little bit because I think that I would have said France too before I started with this project, and uh, I started to think about why, you know. I think that this is simply a great example of a very clever and successful branding exercise carried out by the French. <laughs> I mean, you visit France, you buy a baguette, you buy an eclair, and it's like all fantastic, you know? <laughs> but if we start to look a bit more deeply into what French baking culture actually is, it's like the polar opposite of the Nordic one. As opposed to ours, French baking culture is almost entirely driven by professional bakeries. People in France, they don't bake much at all at home. And I mean, why would they? Um, there's a bakery in every little tiny village in France. And the country is densely populated, and it's very evenly populated, so there are tiny little villages with tiny little bakeries everywhere, you know? Um, historically, there wouldn't have been much incentive to produce your daily bread as a staple in the, ha in the home. But if we take this a bit further and, and sort of analyze a little bit what this means for the diversity of culture, I mean, I imagine that many of you in this room, perhaps even most of you, uh, you would have been to France, perhaps bought something from a French pastry or French bakery. Perhaps you were there on vacation or perhaps you lived there for a while. Um, I think that most of us can agree that French bakeries are lovely I and mean, they're great. The baguette, the butter croissant, pain au chocolat, apricot turnovers, flan, pain au rassin. I mean, all of these are examples of great things. And I too love a French bakery. I used to live there. I've been to a lot of French bakeries. <laughs> In fact, I've been to a lot of French bakeries all across the country. And what's very striking is that they're kind of all the same. They have almost exactly the same repertoire, regardless of geographical location, within this fairly large country. Sure, the butter rolled into the croissants up north in Brittany. It might be a little bit salter than the butter outside of Nice. Perhaps the apricots are fresh in the south and canned in the north. And there are definitely some regional variations and some regional specialties that are sort of added on to this standard repertoire. But all in all, they are remarkably similar. And as I said before, in France, people rarely bake at home. And if they do, it would most often be for dessert, not really for bread. And the thing, as you might understand now with me talking about it, is that bakeries don't really promote cultural individuality and diversity. And this is because they are businesses. And businesses, they have to function financially to uh, 
to be able to stay open. And this happens when you, know, you find this sweet spot between what people want to buy and pay for and what's possible to produce in an efficient way, uh, enough manner. And there's a lot of circumstances in every type of business that would dictate what's possible and not. And these circumstances, they tend to streamline the process and the possibilities for uh, any type of business. And very often, we forget that this also applies to businesses in food. And especially, we tend to forget that it applies to small businesses in food as much as it does to larger um, examples of manufacturing. <coughs> and I think it's sort of, you can, you can make an example here. You can make a parallel with the uh, car companies. I mean, uh, we have quite a few of those. Not as many as we have bakeries, but they are, on the other hand, bigger. So it's still interesting. I mean, except for some small cosmetical differences, they pretty much do the same thing, don't they? You know, rectangular box, a wheel in each corner, a thing that goes in that direction or that direction. You know, um, they share a lot of similar characteristics. And it's the same reason that they do this as it is that the bakeries in France have a very similar repertoire. That's what the market wants. And it's uh, uh, in combination with what's possible to produce. And also, most bakeries, I mean, they're run by bakers. And these bakers, they've gone to school somewhere. And in school, they've learned how to bake. And incidentally, uh, they learned to bake pretty much exactly the same stuff as all of the other people who went to school to learn to bake, learned how to bake. Um, and this is, in most cases, also what they're going to teach the next generation of bakers coming after them about baking, because it worked for them, right? Um, so in, in baking cultures driven by bakeries, you will almost inevitably have only a fraction of the diversity found in cultures driven by people baking at home. And this is another reason why there is no more diverse baking culture in the world than the Nordic. And I think here, actually, a, a small comparison between the US and Sweden really illustrates the difference in how much people actually bake at home. Uh, because one thing that I noticed very early on with this book, when we started sending out recipes to recipe testers in different parts of the world, was that it's very difficult to buy fresh yeast here. Um, I mean, it, to the point where if you want to get some fresh yeast, you have to sort of sneak up some back alley and into the back door in a bakery and try to beg and buy some of their yeast stash. Uh, I, mean, I mean, this is very different from Sweden, for example, where you can buy fresh yeast in every grocery store, every supermarket, every 7-Eleven, and every petrol station, and many newsstands even carry fresh yeast. And this is obviously not just because they're like really brightly colored, beautiful little cubes. Um, it's because people buy them, and they buy them because they want to bake with them. And we can, we can also have a look at the geography and climate, because this is a, another very important influence on what people eat. Even today, when we move produce around in every which direction, uh, the way people used to have to eat, it influences the way we choose to eat a lot. And as I said before, the Nordics, it's a vast region. Um, from the southernmost bit in Denmark to the furthest north of the Spitsberg Islands, north of Norway, from Finland in the east to Greenland all the way in the west. I mean, it's a huge area. You can fit all of the rest of Europe a whole bunch of times in there. Uh, you can also fit the US in there. And sure, a lot of this is ocean, uh, so no one lives there. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it kind of doesn't really matter, because what matters when it comes to cultural diversity is actually the distance between the extremes where people live, much more than you know, having uh, an equivalent amount of people spread out over an even area. And in terms of climate, naturally, you will have a vast variation in such a large area, many, many different climate zones. And this, in its turn, it will mean that what people have been able to grow in the past and thereby bake with and integrate into our food culture, it's varied a lot between different parts. I mean, you can take wheat, for example. Wheat is a, is a grain that needs pretty particular circumstances to function well as a crop. It needs to have warm enough summers long enough summers, it needs to have quite a lot of water, and it needs to have very, very rich and fertile soil to produce a, a great crop. 
And those circumstances, you don't really find them in many parts of the Nordic region. And where you find good growing conditions for wheat, it incidentally coincides exactly with where all of those cities were located that I talked about before. Uh, and incidentally, it's also where you'll find most of the traditional breads based on wheat. And then you can look at uh, other parts of the Nordics. Let's say Denmark alone. <laughs> so Denmark has the most fertile uh, grounds of the Nordic region, the best climate for farming. They have all of that. And they grow a lot of wheat. And they've done it for a long time. But they didn't really eat most of it themselves, because wheat has always been a very um, expensive trade commodity as well. So most of the wheat, historically, was just sold to Central Europe. And on the poorer soils in Denmark, uh, rather than wheat, which wouldn't grow there, they would grow rye. Because rye, it ripens reliably every summer in a climate like the one in Denmark. Uh, and they kept the rye for themselves. So in Denmark, you will, in addition to those wheat breads, you will also have a great rye baking tradition. And because of this, and because of the fact that Denmark and Sweden, South Sweden, are very close together geographically, in both South Sweden and Denmark, you will find quite a few breads that are baked with a mix of rye and wheat, which you don't really find anywhere else in the Nordic region. And then uh, Finland. So most of Finland, it's too cold in the summer to grow wheat. So they grow rye there. And the southern bit, uh, and the bit towards towards Russia, it has inland climate, and the summer is too dry there for uh, wheat to grow, even if it's warm enough. But rye, it can take uh, a lot less water to ripen well. So they grow rye almost all of the whole country, and this is the reason why Finland almost don't have a wheat baking culture. It's almost entirely rye based. If we look at uh, sort of uh, the northern parts of Scandinavia, like nor northern parts of Sweden, where I'm from, it's too cold in the summers to grow both rye and wheat. Doesn't work. So people used to buy, uh, grow oats or barley. And oats, it doesn't have any gluten in it at all, and barley has very little gluten. So the further north you get in Scandinavia, the flatter the breads, you know, because you need to have gluten to make fluffy breads. <laughs> To the point where you reach sort of where I grew up, where it's pretty much only flatbreads, either soft or hard flatbreads. And I mean, once again, I'm going to compare this to France, <laughs> just because it's, it compares so well. Um, what grain do they have in France? What's the predominant grain there? Well, it's wheat. It's just wheat. It's wheat, wheat, wheat everywhere. Uh, and why would it be anything else? I mean, it's the uh, most well-paid-for grain that you can grow uh, in Europe, at least in historical times. So anyone who has uh, soil that can grow wheat will probably do that. Uh, but this also informs their baking culture. And if you look at all of those French breads that we just talked about, what are they based from? They're based from wheat. And Naturally, I mean, the climate and its limiting factors has created a lot of diversity in the Nordic region. And instead of one single grain that dominates all of baking culture, we have four that were all equally important in different parts of the region. And this is another reason why Nordic baking culture has more variations in breads and cakes and cookies and buns than any other baking culture. And as I said before, the Nordic region is vast, but it's also a vast area that's almost entirely located in the marginal climate. And uh, marginally, for people to marginally for people to successfully live there, that is, I mean, uh, it's a climate where, I mean, you can't just, you know, in historic times, you couldn't just move in there and expect to be able to harvest plant-based foods all year round, like you would in large parts of the Mediterranean, for example, in the Southeast Asia, and many other warmer climates. And the interesting thing is that all marginal climates in the whole world, they have two product groups in common, which have had huge uh, historic impo historical importance and essentially made people live through the harsh winters. And those product groups, there are grains and dairy. And <clears throat> both grains and dairy, they are not only high in energy, but they're also very easy to produce in large quantities during a relatively cool summer. And on top of that, they're also very easily prepared for storage. 
I mean, you think uh, for milk, it's like cultured dairy, it's butter, it's cheese, you know, things that keep really well. And on top of that, things that are very dense in energy, so they, they take up very little storage space. And then for grains, I mean, pretty much all of the seeds of perennial grasses, um, they dry really well, they store really well, and they can be turned into a lot of different things. When I've traveled around, it's fascinating to see how accurate this is. And it doesn't matter if you're visiting like a village in the Peruvian Andes, if it's a monastery in, the, in Bhutan in the Himalayas, or if it's sort of suburban Stockholm, you know? Um, when you start talking to people and you look at what they eat today by choice and what they had to eat in the past if they lived there, it's just fascinating to see that it doesn't matter if it's uh, uh, corn, red rice, or wheat, or if it's uh, milk from llama or yak or cow, but these two product groups, they've played a huge role. And I think that baking, which is actually, as I learned by making this book, very hard to define you know, what's actually, what baking actually is. And I, I've kind of come to the conclusion that baking is simply the term for um, all of the ways of making stored grains, plain in many cases, but often in combination with dairy, into products that are more easy to eat, more tasty, more easily digested for us, and more varied than you know, just the uh, base products themselves. And I think that the fact that we've created so much variation with such a limited range, limited number of um, base products as we have in baking, you know, if you compare it to savory cooking, where you have thousands of different <laughs> raw materials going into various recipes, whilst with baking you have, you know, pretty much all baking recipes contain like the same six things in different quantities and variations. I, th I think that says a lot about how big a part of, all of our um, caloric intake that used to be made up of baked goods, because otherwise we would never have been motivated to create such a variation. Uh, and today we, we tend to tell ourselves that we decide what we eat, you know? that no one else influences what I put in my mouth. No one else dictates what products we buy and what we make from them. And I think this is completely wrong. I mean, we are animals, all of us. We do exactly what our species has always done. We procure products that make sense of us and that are available at the moment. And then we process them in whatever way we've been taught by our ancestors or by other trusted sources. Um, and then we eat them either alone or with our flock. I mean, that's what we do. And the thing that fascinates me so much with all of this is the degree and the amount of cultural knowledge that we sort of, without thinking about it, transfer from generation to generation. And eating correctly grown, preserved, stored, and subsequently prepared uh, foods, it used to be incredibly important for our ancestors. For them, that was simply about survival. And I mean, survival is, as we know, the single strongest motivating force of the human being. For us today, eating breads, cakes, buns, cookies, and whatever else we've baked, it's mostly about pleasure, right? But why do we find baking and baked goods so pleasurable? And the easy explanation here, the one that we hear all of the time, is that we're hardwired to crave foods that are dense in energy, which most baked goods are. But I don't think that it's that simple, because that, doesn't, that, that only you know, explains why we enjoy eating a cookie. It doesn't explain why we enjoy baking a cookie. And I, I asked a lot of people this, and I've, I've looked a lot about how I feel about cooking as well and baking, and uh, remarkably often people seem to take more pleasure in baking than in cooking. I mean, I think that I have, you know, I reach sort of a, a higher level of self-satisfaction when I've baked a cake than when I've made an omelette, for example. And I've actually made a little observation since this book came out. So, I almost never get tagged by people on Instagram that have made um, dishes based on my recipes from the Nordic cookbook. It happens like once a month, twice a month. Since this book came out, it is like 20 a day <laughs> who, who tag me and they made like buns and cooks and cakes and biscuits and you know, all kinds of things. And I think this says a lot about our sense of self-satisfaction when we bake. And 
I think that the reason for this is simply that it's you know, our minds making sure subconsciously that we don't lose this information that used to be vital for our ancestors to have, how to process grains into tasty food, that we don't lose that between generations simply by making it so pleasurable that everyone want to do it. And I think this sort of boils down to my final big reason to why the Nordic bacon culture truly is the greatest and most diverse around. I mean, preparing grains um, in this way, it used to be more important where I come from than almost anywhere else in the world. And therefore, um, regardless if we want to or not, I think that Nordic people enjoy baking a little bit more than almost anywhere else in the world as well. Um, and therefore, I mean, uh, a culture which is constantly in use and constantly allowed to change because it's being practiced all the time, it will always be broader and deeper and more diverse than, 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 than one which isn't, you know, that, than one which is static. So, thank you. Adam. <laughs> <coughs> All right, that's a hard act to follow, and you're still you're still part of this act, so that's good. Uh, I wrote down a lot of insightful insightful questions. Uh, I'm going to pick one at random to start. Who who was the first American journalist to write a sizable story about you that really <laughs> set you on your path and kind of set you up for for success here in probably what I yeah. assume is your largest uh, book buying Kate market? Crater. What's that? He was Kate Crater. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, it was Adam. Yeah, okay, <laughs> got that. Get that out of the way. Um, so I think if you if you're familiar, uh, if you're here, you're probably a little bit familiar with Fabikin, with the backstory. If you've seen Chef's Table, if you've read a little bit about Magnus, um, I, I'd love to get uh, into sort of uh, for you the kind of beginnings of your awareness of where you were, you know, you as one person in 300 something square meters <laughs> uh, growing up in, in, in the north uh, inland in, in Sweden. You, you talk early in the book about the, that you were sort of introduced to this idea of four grains and they were kind of the, the centrality of these four grains. And you, you know, you say that, uh, you write that all modern cereal crops are in fact the seeds of grasses, regardless of whether we're talking about corn, rice, or wheat. Without them and without the combination of them human, and, and human eagerness, which is a great phrase, uh, <laughs> to solve problems, there would be no baking and probably no civilization for that matter. No, so that's true. How, how did you first kind of come across these four grains and, and what role do they play in your imagination about the food you, you, were, you were exposed to as a kid? I mean, when, when I grew up, I thought that there were only four grains. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because that's, I mean, we, we, were, we weren't exactly taught in school that there were only four grains, but no one told us about the they other grains. Out the other they ones. left yeah. out that. And there was a lot of focus of, you know, grains being uh, like, you know, the stuff to eat. When I grew up, the recommendation from the Food and Health Safety Board in Sweden was still that six slices of bread a day was like a, <laughs> a good target, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Just a, ba a baseline. Yeah, like a, a liter of milk, yeah. you know? <laughs> uh, well, that's actually, that's interesting, because you talk... That's why we were so tall, all of us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tall and wide. Uh, you talk in the book about, you, you actually break down... Um, you, you contrast your sort of uh, daily diet with your father's, mm -hmm. and you do a, you do an example of a, of a daily uh, diet of his. So uh, first, talk schedule. about what fika is, yeah. yeah, and then talk about the, the fika schedule for a, a standard <laughs> issue uh, bread eating Swede like your dad. Yeah, exactly. No, so the fika, which has become a bit of a buzzword over here, I think, is completely hijacked. <laughs> it's like all we, kinds of we, coffee we, chains that are called right, fika now and whatnot. Right, we guys uh, So fika is just, it's simply the name of a snack in between meals. And usually it's coffee and something sweet. And the origins of fika is that when people had to produce this excess of calories in summer, like all of that grain in the area that we talked about, they had to work very long day in the fields. And to keep them going the whole day, they obviously ate a lot. So it was probably like fika, breakfast, fika, lunch, fika, dinner, and then fika, you know? Uh, Wait, what was, what, there's a name for the pre-breakfast. You, you said your, your yeah, dad ate it in solitary. That's morning fika. Black coffee before the kids wake and, up. And the funny thing, I mean, our generation now, it's mostly, I mean, fika has become a, a pretty much purely a social thing. It's something yeah. that's done in the workplace uh, or at home when you're off and you know, it's something that you do to socialize. And you do it maybe once or twice a day, um, but 
I mean, my dad's generation, and he's not that old. I mean, he was born in the 50s. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, uh, he definitely has a good bunch of the, all of the speakers I said before. And I mean, he's a physiotherapist, so it's not like he's doing a 16-hour <laughs> shift in the field, you know? <laughs> 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 who, who is making all these cakes for six times a day? Everyone. They're just cakes. You just have yeah. stashes of cakes. Yeah. yeah. And what, what's the name of the, of the... There's the post-dinner, pre-bedtime family fika that has... A, what's the name of that? Yeah, kvälls fika. So Evening fika. Evening fika. <laughs> yeah. We do that, actually, at home. You do? Yeah. I mean, nice. Swedes generally have early dinner. Yeah. Like my parents, they have dinner at five. Yeah. Um, and... Because I'm an unstructured person, I have dinner anywhere, any, anytime between <laughs> five and nine. Um, but if it's not too late, I will also go for a little, like a little kvetsvika. <laughs> you are you are, are not an unstructured person. Um, you, speaking of structure, you you say you talk in the book. You address a kind of common cliche about baking versus savory cooking. Let's call it. You say that everyone always tells me that baking is a science and cooking is more of an art. And then you basically say that that's <laughs> yeah, nonsense. It's very silly. I mean, what, it's <laughs> what, what do you mean? What, what, I, th- I think I, I think it's actually like with all things that people don't understand fully. <laughs> instead of like trying to understand, most of us dismiss it by labeling things with something. Yeah. And it's like you look at this great painting, for example, and you you meet the artist and you see the artist in the distance, and you're on a you're on a show in a gallery, uh, and then you say to your friend that you know he must be such a creative person who made that. <laughs> But maybe it's not. Maybe he's just really good at painting, you know? It's just that you didn't understand how he did it, and then he's a creative guy. Um, And it's sort of the same thing, you know? Things that we don't quite get, we like to, like, you know, uh, label them with sort of some kind of casual phrase, you know? We make them a little more mysterious because we don't 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 have to deal with them, you know? Oh, it's science, it's fine. But that's art. Yeah, you're right. I think what they're trying to imply is that in cooking, you can be a bit more playful when you follow recipes, while in baking, you have to follow them to the letter. I don't think this is true. This is a very magnet statement, which is, <laughs> you've already seen. Uh, I don't think this is true at all. Baking and cooking are just the same. Yeah. Um, so what, what aren't we getting about baking? That, it, that it's, mm. if, if we know, is it like jazz? You, you know the rules, you can riff on it and kind of play against the rules? Or what, what, what are we missing? I don't, I don't know. I mean, baking is kind of fascinating like that because it's, of all of the fields of cooking, it has the lowest sort of entry point because uh, most of the recipes are very well produced mm-hmm. because of this reason that you're talking about, actually. Right. So if you just follow a, a well-made baking recipe to the dot, I mean, you will get something nice out of it. Um, and on the other hand, baking is the most difficult field in cooking to become intuitive in, I think. Right. I mean, most people, even those who don't cook very much, um, they can taste something and it's like, oh, this needs a bit more salt, you know? Yeah. Or this one is too thick, I'll add a bit more water. Yeah. Uh, there's not that many people who can like whip up a batter for, you know, sponge cake and it's like, I think this needs a bit more flour. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's not very common. And, and why that is, I don't know. If it's just that we, like in our daily lives, just practice so much more on cooking um, than we do in baking, or if there is something else. But you make a couple of points in the book, I think, that you, you notes that you hit repeatedly. One is simply just to keep doing it, and then also to trust your eyes. To, if, it, I, if, yeah. you say, if you say in the book, you know, the dough should be wet, and it's not, <laughs> don't just, <laughs> don't, totally don't problem, just go ahead. Yeah. Uh, but I think that, that's a big hurdle, because, yeah, you can taste, you know, if you're making an omelet, it may not. Uh, come out perfectly, but you you sort of know if it needs more salt. And with yeah. baking, I think, it, is it just that we don't do enough of it? I or? don't know. I mean, uh, I, I think that it, it might have to do also with this idea that it, baking is science, that you have to follow the recipes. Right. Um, because otherwise some great disaster is going to strike you. <laughs> um, <laughs> But mostly it doesn't. Usually the only thing that happens is that something gets either a little bit more good or a little bit less good than <laughs> right. the you know, intended version. Right. You're right. I mean, so you talk about the recipes in the book and the, the process, and maybe you could go into the process a little bit uh, deeper, that it's a, it's a documentary cookbook. So mm-hmm. that, as you're describing in your talk, that this was, you didn't just sort of, these aren't, you know, Magnus's versions of top, no. top 20, top There's four, one recipe that's mine of in the whole book. <laughs> Should we guess which one, or yeah, is it say? if you want to. Oh, it's uh, is it the the, uh, the the drink in the back? What drink in the there's back? A dr- <laughs> there's a drink in the back. There's a, there's a drink in the back no, in the, maybe, in the maybe glass. I, maybe yeah. there it are says two Magnus is something. It might be two recipes then. <laughs> maybe. Uh, no, the one that uh, the different the, the, the Magnus. Soft, the soft yeah. Swedish flatbreads is my family recipe. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. I'm just going to forget so that. There are two question. recipes in the book. So talk about that. So you, you talk about in flatbreads 
that there are two distinct kinds of flatbreads, that there's soft and hard, and, and soft is essentially what you're eating in the moment, and hard <coughs> is what you're aging. Is that, growing up, do the, both of those play a role in a kind of daily Swedish diet? Yeah, they uh, do, diet? they do. Uh, like, especially, I mean, the, the soft ones, they play the role in, in my daily life when I grew up, because we have freezers now. So you would freeze them after baking. Uh, traditionally, they would only be eaten okay. a day or two after the day you baked, and yeah. you bake flatbreads maybe four times a year. Yeah. So most of the time it was hard. So you would freeze them. Yeah. But in like the, the daily diet of Swedes and Norwegians and to some extent Finns, not the Danes, they do it differently. But in these three countries, um, I mean, the different uh, hard flatbreads and like hard tack and crisp rolls and stuff like that has a really big role. Uh, and it's something that's served with every meal, like every meal. Every meal. Um, you, so up north you're saying remote empty, barren wasteland where you have all your breads are flat. Uh, <laughs> but even in Stockholm and in, in yeah. sort of more bountiful yeah, regions, yeah, absolutely. You, you and, and it would be like, I mean, it would be that and potatoes would be like the daily carbohydrate staple. Yeah. So my grandparents, for example, I mean, they would have potatoes with everything. I mean, it would be, you know, spaghetti bolognese and then potatoes <laughs> and hard tack. <laughs> yeah. So it's like it's amazing. That's, that's what we think of Swedish food. It's yeah. amazing that... Uh, it, it wasn't voted higher than the French. Uh, um, <laughs> you, uh, speaking of spaghetti bolognese, we've, we've talked about, I think, spaghetti bolognese and lasagna. And if you go to Favikin and, you, and you're lucky enough to go back in the kitchen, I, I haven't been there in a while. I was there before the grand expansion. It was a 12-seat restaurant. Exactly. Now they've 24. massively expanded mm. to 24 seats. So uh, it's changed. It's changed. I, was, I like, uh, you know, it was there in a you different, like different era. Formats, different yeah. era. Yeah. Mm. Um, but you, would, you all would have a pineapple pizza as your staff meal. We once like that. Yeah, we do. Um, but you talk, you, you, <laughs> you, there's a note that you strike in the book that's very comforting, but slightly maybe contradictory to me, and I want you to explain it, where you say uh -oh. that cuisine is not static, that the, you know, of the food of, of a region or, or a, you know, a country or an area never stays the same, and it's good to mix it up a little bit. If you want to double the cardamom in, in, a, in a, you know, a roll recipe, go ahead if it makes you happy, or if you don't like cardamom, you know, put in ketchup or whatever you think Americans <laughs> would put in. But um, so you, on the one hand, you say kind of have at it and, it and everything is fair game. And on the other hand, you produce, this is your second, you know, massive book, uh, <laughs> which is a document of kind of cuisine as it is. Mm. So wh where, where, do you, what, where do you fall on that? Um, so I, it's very easy to adopt uh, an opinion when you work in food and when you're passionate about food that all of these uh, immediately appealing, often very cute, slightly exotic food cultural traditions that are on the brink of extinction, that they should be preserved in a bubble. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've had some really ferocious discussions with like the slow food people about this. Yes. Um, yes. There are some very, very boring conversations <laughs> you can have about yeah. around authenticity, and they're, they're yeah. also but important. But the, 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 the thing with this is that what I've kind of come to understand is that you can't do that because people are going to eat right. what makes sense there and then. You can't force traditions to uh, stay active. It doesn't work that way. Right. Uh, and uh, this is just something that we figure out now, like the last. 30 years <laughs> that all of these traditions deserve to buy, you know, remain static in eternity. Uh, and the only thing I think we should do is to make sure that we record and document what's right. there. Because it's a, it's a great waste and pity when knowledge that's been you know, uh, amassed over generations and sometimes thousands of years just sort of disappears because we stop practicing. But it's like, I, I take the example of um, Swedish sour herring, surströmming, the officially the stinkiest food in the whole world. Worse than durian? Not worse. It's like more intense. Durian, durian is like, you know, it's a fruit. <laughs> this is fish. It's like, I mean, <laughs> you know. But Fair so the, the yeah. funny thing with, with sour herring, it's like that the people think that it's an ancient dish, which is not. I mean, yeah. it's intensely tied to industrialization because it relies entirely on being re fermented in a tin can, so it didn't exist before industrialization. Um, and less and less people eat it now. And at some point, I mean, this trend is going to continue. I, mean, I, don't eat, I don't eat it, and I have no intentions of teaching my kid how to eat it. You, know, you, you don't like it? No, I don't like it. Yeah. I mean, I like that it's there, and I think it's an interesting historical document, but I think it's absolutely terrible to eat. <laughs> and, and I mean, it's fine. Other people might like this. You know, it's okay. But 
So at some point, uh, you're going to hit a point where where it becomes unsustainable for uh, these factories to produce sour herring, and because it's a, an a process entirely <laughs> reliant on factories to exist, you can't make sour herring at home. It will right. never be sour herring. Right. Uh, it will just be some other weird fermented fish, you know. Uh, and and then I mean it will just cease to exist overnight. And I think that this is going to happen within 30 years. Yeah. And after that, there will be no sour we're herring. All, we're all worried about it. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, the only thing I want is that it gets properly documented. And Document then when it, it ceases to exist, <laughs> file it away, celebrate it, yep. and never, never, never uh, have to eat it. Well, can you, can you fill in? Um, I thought it was fascinating. I mean, your, your pitch for Scandinavian pastries ba uh, baking being the, <laughs> the, the, you know, the dominant uh, one in the world is, is charming and a little bit jingoistic and, <laughs> and interesting. But fill in. Like, I want to challenge you a little bit about that. because You're it, charming. If you <laughs> <laughs> um, if you, you talk about the, the, the variety, but isn't one of the reasons, I mean, if you, ha if you are in a culture where People are, there's more competition, there's more iteration, there's more improvement. I mean, a lot of these dishes, you, you're, you're going at, the, they don't, ex, the, most, the, most of your neighbors don't know all of these, uh, you know, uh, pastries or all these cakes or uh, breads exist. And so you're, they're sort of, the reason that they're, there's this variety is that they are, as you said, sort of spread out and, and, and far from each other and they kind of stay alive. And, you know, the example of, you know, my, my you know, big cake that I'm going to, uh, make famous. <laughs> it only it stays there and it doesn't it doesn't change. But is it aren't cultures that that do sort of push the evolution of it? Aren't they maybe making things more delicious in theory? I mean, I, I don't. I, I mean, delicious is just a point of opinion, and uh, I think that there is a very common uh, misconception about culture that it's something that we actually control what it is. I mean, right. culture is just the sum of whatever we do anyhow. People doing stuff, <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's not the other way around. Right. Um, and, uh, I mean, I work to make things more delicious, uh, but as we talked about before, the book is not about that. And, um, I mean, I haven't figured out any way of judging the greatness of culture except diversity. Because yeah. to me, there is no cultural expressions as, that, that's better than another culture. It's just culture. It's like, I mean, and, and this is sort of something, that, on a personal level, I mean, I can obviously have a preference for certain things. I mean, I, I like your burger at home more than I like, let's say, McDonald's. Right. But culturally speaking, I mean, none is better than the other. Right. And I, I'm joking about this a little bit, but it, it does. And so how, <laughs> how the, but fill in that picture a little bit. How, how do these individual sort of remote islands of, of tradition, how do they, before you go out and, and, and call around and, and, and cast about for, you know, recipes, how do they stay alive? I mean, in, in what you're describing of these communities where the cake can only reach 20 people or the, <laughs> you know, the bread can, can't make it very far. How did they stay alive? Was it that the I mean, people ate when this, you know, people ate yeah. as much as they do today, a bit less perhaps, but you know, <laughs> generally speaking. Um, and, uh, and, and I mean, that's the thing uh, we all eat. That's yeah. why culture, like food culture is the most cult uh, important cultural expressions that we have in, in human, you know, in humanity, uh, because we all eat um, and we all eat something. Yeah. And uh, I mean, one thing that's very interesting though, is that, I mean, I think almost all of us, at least in the West, we eat a more varied diet now than we did 10 years ago, uh, because we have access to much more information more right. easily, uh, which is great for all of us. So we all feel like we are like you know learning new things, experiencing new food, yeah. you know eating more varied and so on. But if you if you take all of food culture and just lump it up, I would say that we probably have less variety now than we've ever had because many more of us do the same stuff, a bit like I talked about in the beginning. Right. Um, and I mean, on a personal level, I can feel that this is a little bit sad because it's going to ultimately lead to a, a much less interesting eating world. But on the other hand, the individual has access to more diversity now. And you right. can't really argue that that's a bad thing. Right. It's nice so. to be able to make spaghetti bolognese wherever you are on the planet. It is. But it's sad that you're not making what you're It's sad that we're all making spaghetti bolognese in a way. Or, uh, you know. you, you, it's very complex, that. Yeah. Because, yeah, you, there's, you talk, I mean, you, you talked a, a little bit uh, about 
pleasure and why baking it maybe connects us to the pleasure of actually doing it as opposed to the pleasure of eating it. And I think if you look through the book, I mean, you saw a lot of the images here, which are, I don't, did you, do we make it clear that all these photos are uh, by Magnus and they're really beautiful. And, uh, um, and the, the, book, the book is beautifully illustrated. And, but I think if you, you know, as I was flipping through it, reading it in depth for this conversation, um, I think if you read between the lines a little bit, part of that pleasure is because if you look at those pictures, a lot of them are of a hearth, they're of, you know, of a fireplace in a in a in a home kitchen. Even the the illustrations of, of how you uh, roll or tie a, a uh, you know a, a dough, there's it's very sort of intimate and real and kind of it does feel like it connects us to an older way of cooking. Yeah. There's no sous vide. There's no. I mean, you, you, you do allow that you can temper yeah. chocolate with microwaves, but yeah. there's something maybe about just the <laughs> what you have to do or or the trappings of baking that I, I, I think, make I us think, happy. But I think there's like a really important thing here is that all of those things they might feel a bit old-fashioned. Some of them have been going on for a long time, yeah. but they are also all being practiced right now. Right. Uh, and I think that's what's unique with the Nordics, you know, and that people do bake, you know, and they really do. Right. And for, I mean, for us in... You bake. Not well, but um, <laughs> for us, it's a choice, though. I mean, you, you know, we're... I it's think a choice part, for us, too. Right. But, but you, I mean, what you used can, to be needed buy it, informs but. our choices today, which is, I mean, it's, it's kind of stupid, really, if you think about it. Like, I mean, we, instead of using all of this variety that we have access to yeah. uh, in our sort of privileged world, uh, we choose actively to do exactly what people had to do in the past yeah. and that they, you know, what they probably didn't want to do right. at all in the past. Right. But we I mean, take... they, didn't, they didn't want to eat porridge in the morning. <laughs> right. Or, or... <laughs> but I want to do that. It's right. very strange, the whole thing. Oh, the whole, yeah. <laughs> well, all, I mean, so much of what you do at, uh, at Favigan and so much of what you have in the books, oh, yeah, it's celebrating things that used to be done because they were necessary, because they were about preserving for the, the long winters. But, I, you know, I sometimes yeah, I was on a panel about the future of kitchens, and everyone's trying I to say we're in San Francisco <laughs> where everyone's trying to solve for these problems. And these aren't problems for me. These are, this is the pleasure. This <laughs> yeah. is, I want to do that. Yeah, I, yeah. I want to, you know, we, I think people who, uh, who celebrate what you celebrate in your books, even if they just read them and don't cook out of them, it's, it's nice to hear that they are baking out of this book, but they, you, you want to slow things down and you want to kind of, is it, do you think it's to get in touch with an, an older way or is that these things simply give us pleasure to, to sort of go through these motions? I don't know. Well, that's not an answer. <laughs> I've I mean, never heard you I say. I don't know. I've I've never mean, heard I mean, you say I, 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 I just thought it, for me it was just an in, like very interesting observation that yeah. people appear to be using Doing the recipes more. much more yeah. in this book than they've done with any of the other books that are written. I mean, with Fabrikan, well, I kind of understand that Fabrican people don't for sure. yeah. generally cook well, much aside from Aside from like the, the <coughs> pig's blood pancakes, you yeah. know, they are. You, you said you know, there, there are six basic uh, ingredients and... And so maybe people feel comfortable, you know, uh, yeah. playing with them. Sugar butter. Um, talk about pancakes for a little bit. I, I counted pancakes. 17 recipes, not including waffles. Yeah. Uh, what? What? <laughs> we like pancakes. <laughs> we, one very important thing, yeah. which differs, you know, uh, us from you guys, is that we don't yeah. have pancakes for breakfast. You don't? No. Have you it, tried it? We have it for I have. And now we do it. These days we do it. You but we, then we do like thick American pancakes for breakfast. Have you been to IHOP? <laughs> it's international. <laughs> we don't have it in Sweden. <laughs> uh, no, but when it, what, so pancake no, is a it's is dinner. a dessert. It's, it's dinner. dinner. It's a main meal. Yeah, we. we <laughs> yeah, I was it doesn't with sound my, amazing. I was with my family in uh, in Gotland, uh, Sweden, which is a beautiful island, and my seven year old son was thrilled when <laughs> the server made the mistake of letting him know that pancakes with whipped cream and raspberries was an acceptable choice for his main course <laughs> yeah, for dinner. It's, a, it's, yeah. it's more than acceptable. How is that not a dessert? That's clearly a dessert. No, it's a dish. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not. It's not. In what way? Expl de defend this. I mean, just this, you know. It's, a, it's not breakfast, for sure. Oh, okay. All right. It's dinner. But it's still dessert then, isn't it? It's... It's you can sweet. have dessert too if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> for your for your late fika, the bed, bedtime fika. Yeah, I guess if you're having six cakes a day, yeah. what's what's one more sweet pancake? Yeah. No, what, you what, like our carbs. Uh, 
What it, so what, why do you think uh, pancakes hold this uh, role in, in Swedish uh, or in Scandinavian? I mean, I think that they, uh, it all, go, all goes back to, uh, you know, when uh, more people were in farming and they lived on small family farms, yeah. diverse farms. And it's just, I mean, you look at the pancake is, it's uh, whatever flour you have, milk and eggs, yeah. uh, things that you had on your farms. It's just a... Uh, very quick and convenient way of doing something with only products that you will have there. You serve with whipped cream also from the farm, <laughs> berries <laughs> on the farm, <laughs> you know. Um, and you, it's tasty. And it's tasty, yeah, mm. of course. Uh, you, I think one of the pleasurable things about the book is just that, you, you know, you're saying that Americans don't have a very clear idea about what uh, Scandinavian baking is. And, that, and so just even just flipping through and finding things like that, you talk about uh, Barkis or Bergis, mm -hmm. and it's sort of. Uh, Are you going to be very difficult questions here now? It's difficult. <laughs> well, no, it's it's so you 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 say uh, in Sweden, Barkis from Stockholm or Bergis from Gothenburg refers to a loaf of white milk bread that is covered in poppy seeds before being baked. The bread has its roots in the traditional Jewish bread challah eaten on the Sabbath, and the word itself comes from the Yiddish word barakot. So, how did a Yiddish Jewish braided egg or milk bread end up in Stockholm? I mean, I've written about this, <laughs> but I don't quite remember exactly the backstory. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there are a lot of recipes. There no, are a lot of I, recipes. It was, it was actually, yeah. I mean, uh, so in one of the, uh, the first um, uh, Jewish communities in Sweden was actually not in Stockholm. I think it was either in Norrköping or Linköping. Um, are those in the south? Or in, sorry? Or are they in the where are they in That's like south? in between. It's like in the central okay. Sweden, outside of yeah. And, and uh, I know that it was first baked there, and I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain that there is like a fairly long little text in the book about this. <laughs> it's just putting me on the spot now. I think this is unfair. I mean, it's a thousand recipes. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know it. Well, yeah, right. I read the book instead. Read the book. Um, <laughs> you, you talk about the, um, that people are, are baking out of it, and I think uh, one of the pleasurable things about reading any of your books is that your voice comes through and you're, you're a very particular person who wants <laughs> things to be done a bit of, in I've, I've not just a particular way, true. but in your, in your way, you have an entire page about how to make an egg wash and how to apply the egg wash to the bread. Uh, you have an entire, I think almost a full page about how slow to open the oven door. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, are it, we there are very few things that make me like more irritated inside than when people just, you know. Yeah. So. And you just, you just see the cake that like, collapsing. As, so, as someone who's, I'm, pro I'm sure I'm in the minority here, but I've never thought about again, you know? the velocity of my door openings. Mm -hmm. how, how, how should we be opening an oven door? Like first you kind of just, like, like you're not sure you're going to so open that it? So the, the pressure... Is it the element of surprise? What are we... What I are think we, it is. Okay. You want the air, the air, like the atmospheric pressure in the, in the door to even out. Okay. So first you kind of just open it like oh, that, like yeah. this much. And yeah. then you slowly open it. Yeah. Otherwise you get... And like, you don't uh, taste release. Or so too, it too shocking, like bumps shocking down system. in the end because it shakes the cake, right? Ah, and then okay. if it's not done, you have to do the same when you go up again. So close it slowly. Mm -hmm. And not like slam it not because then jarring, you, know, you change okay. the atmospheric pressure and the cake goes flat. All right. Or flatter. But you're a very relaxed <laughs> guide. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> very precise. What about egg wash? So egg wash you can make... How big is your bowl? You said you, you, you whisk so it. The thing with egg wash is this. I mean, almost all of the time, it's like <laughs> people... It's like lumps in egg wash. Yeah. People to put too much of it. Yeah. And, you have and then they jar it with the do oven door and fringe of like it, it's like eating plastic, you know? Yeah. And all you have to do is to like have the correct proportions of egg and liquid and then whisk it first. Okay. Until there are no lumps, you know? And no then, lumps. And then just not apply so much. <laughs> <laughs> it shouldn't be a pool of egg around the thing. Okay. All right. I feel like we could we could we can learn from that. Um, you, you talked about uh, starting this process um, that you were, I, I assume you mean with the first book too, that you, that you didn't, you were surprised by what you didn't know about your own uh, culinary landscape. What, it, with baking uh, specifically, what, what, what surprised you or what, what didn't you know? I mean, with baking, I think it was just, uh, the, the most surprising thing was like just how much diversity that there was there. 
uh, and how much I sort of didn't know about the baking culture of the other countries. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah. so my yeah. knowledge, especially about sort of the neighboring countries to Sweden, was much more superficial than I expected it to be. Uh, very sort of arrogantly Swedish, <laughs> you know. Um, but and I mean, take Finland for example, which has uh, quite a few things in common with Scandinavia when it comes to the baking culture. Uh, but at the same time, it has so many recipes and traditions that don't exist anywhere else, um, and so many things that are you know that have much more in common with Russia, for example, yeah. or the Baltics, or um, and, and many things like that, you know. And, and also just how everything ties together. Is, were you were there bigger surprises within the differences in uh, in baking within Scandinavia than versus savory food or is uh, that yeah that I same? think so uh, and and like looking back um, I mean I think that I I mean it's not much of a surprise because if you think about the thing with the grains for example that I mean Finland has a, a whole baking culture based only on one grain uh, I mean my part of Sweden has a, another baking culture <laughs> on based on a different grain and so so all of these circumstances obviously lead to a lot of diversity and it's not particularly surprising when you know of them but I, I'd never thought about it that way right before uh, that you know, these things that were necessary in the past still inform the way we choose to eat today to such a high extent and thereby also informs, uh, you know, the, what recipes are out there. And do you, th yeah, do you think the, the sort of introduction of, you talk about the, how the introduction of industrialized yeast changed things in certain, in, mm. in wheat-based regions, yeah. and the rye people were sort of unimpressed. Yeah, <laughs> didn't, very unimpressed. Didn't change their I mean, world. That, it, 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 that's actually something that's, I mean, it's tremendously interesting because so before industrialization and before someone figure out how to process and produce yeast uh, on an industrial scale, all baking was like slow ferments and sourdough essentially. Uh, and then in these regions where many breads were wheat based, when yeast was introduced as a commodity. I mean, imagine the difference, you know, you've, for generations you've made this bread for your family every day, which Waiting was like, around. it took three days to leaven, it was like this thick and, you know, yeah. Um, <laughs> and then you just added yeast and the same thing, it took 45 minutes <laughs> and it was like fluffy, which yeah. was a texture you'd never seen before. Yeah. Obviously that was very appealing, you know, whilst in Finland where it was only rye, um, Rye has much less gluten than wheat, so they didn't get any fluff. I mean, they just got the same kind of, you know, <laughs> nothing much happened. And also the carbohydrate uh, chains are more complex in rye, and they break down in a different way. So, I mean, if you leaven a rye bre pure rye bread for 45 minutes with yeast, it's like eating paperboard, you know? It's it terrible. Just doesn't, doesn't improve. So they were, like you say, very unimpressed with this yeast thing. <laughs> And then they just kept their sourdoughs going. So today they still have like an unbroken track of using sourdough in their uh, in their baking culture. And is, does that extend to regional taste in other food? Is there a sort of bias against fluffiness in Japland or and a? Maybe, I think we're actually even more keen on fluff. Oh, you're into it. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't. So know. you look for it. You look for yeah, it. Yeah, we like fluff. Uh, we like. Fluff. <laughs> <laughs> um, who was uh, who was Gunnar Sjodal? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a hint. No, I know. I can tell you. That was just me joking. He, uh, no, he, inve <laughs> he invented the uh, sandwich layer cake, yes. which is... Uh, Wait, slow down. Okay, that's a phrase that doesn't make sense in English. It's, it's, the sandwich it's, layer it's, cake. It's, uh, so it's a amazing. cake, savory it's, cake. Mayonnaise instead of buttercream. You make a, you, you make a, you make a sandwich. You sure. Know? There's going to be mayonnaise, maybe some, I don't know, salmon or something on there. S slice of the white bread. Roast beef. Another slice. Yeah. Roast beef. Another, and then you just stack them. Yeah. In the, the, like a cake, like a layer cake. Yeah. And then you whip cream and you mix it with mayonnaise. Okay. And you dress the whole exterior. Okay. And then you put like whatever toppings you want on there. I think you and say, it's, it's you usually say, like there's a lot of fruit uh, going on at the same time. Salmon, and meat. meatballs, grapes, shrimp, cucumber, yeah. pineapple, <laughs> preserve, mandarin wedges, ham <laughs> are more common than they are uncommon. Yeah, they are. Uh, um, and, and, and does this exist? It in does. It does. I mean, 
So I don't remember exactly which year this was invented. It says in the book. Uh, it's not that. I mean, it was like maybe the 50s, something like that. 62. Mid-60s. Mid-60s. Um, and it was actually invented in my hometown, and it's spread all over Sweden since. Um, <laughs> and you, you still see it quite a lot. And do people know, like, if you're from Gotland or, I mean, from Gotland, but do you know that it's from where you came no. from? No. No, they don't. You write, however surreal it might sound, if you make it from proper bread, put some effort into the seasoning, and use tasty combination of toppings, all of which are in great quality. Yeah, skip the grapes. It's, it's a, skip the grapes. <laughs> Leave more room for the meatballs. Yeah. Um, I didn't mean to meet, end it on meatballs, sorry. That's, uh, um, all right, I think we've uh, probably at the time where we should open up the floor to questions. Definitely. And I think there's a microphone going around. So. Oh. <laughs> Jordan, Jordan has the microphone. We have, mic well, we have microphones on both sides. First question is in the front. And Magnus and I will call on you if you don't ask questions. So. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Okay. Hello. That wasn't a question. No. Okay. no. No, Mr. Sachs, that was not a question. This, that was, you know, you talk about this very visceral response that we have um, almost primordially. It, it seems like of a primordial nature when we're talking about baking. And I wonder if when we think about the artisanal disciplines that are in cooking, baking or savory, so spirits, wine, chocolate, bread, charcuterie, I wonder if it's because there's so much joy to be had in each of those disciplines, but more often than not, people don't really, you don't see a lot of people at home making boudin blanc. Mm -hmm. It's not because they wouldn't love it if they did, it's just a lot of work. Right. And then you also connect the baking with so many holiday traditions. Does that bring true, do you think? I mean, I, I think that uh, at some point, probably people probably made, made Boudin Blanc at home as well. Uh, I mean, there are still some people who do it, some crazy yeah. people. Um, but I think that a lot of these things, uh, they've always been, to a larger extent, produced by trade. And I think charcuterie is a great example of that. I mean. Uh, it sort of goes, I think, the same way as it does with the bread. I mean, in the countryside, you made your own charcuterie when you killed the pig. Uh, but on a whole, for the last few hundred years, I think that that has been the vast minority of the charcuterie produced in the world. Right. Um, it's only coming back now as a, yeah, a hobby. Exactly. Because, I mean, I mean, even before industrialization, I think most charcuterie was probably produced by you know, butchers in cities. Right. This is me just <laughs> theoreticizing yeah. wildly, but it seems to make sense, I think. Well, and I, I think you also hit on two important things that we, we didn't really talk about. One is the cent central role in holidays and tradition, and the other is the, the odds of success. I mean, if you, uh, if you think about the alchemy that goes into, like, if you bake a chicken, it's browner than it was when you put it in. But if you make a cake, it rises. You know, it's, just, it's stunning. Like, cooking for children, it, it's fun to show them things that change that much and, and there's satisfaction in that in that alchemy and in, in that sort of you know that surprising change that probably gives us a, a lot of a lot of pleasure the next question's on your right Thank you. sure. all right um i know in one of the episodes of mind of a chef you actually went foraging for the seagull eggs mm -hmm. um, do you ever use that in baking uh, or is it just for savory? Uh, I, I, so i don't i don't use seagull eggs at all actually uh, and in Sweden, we don't. We don't have any tradition of eating uh, wild bird's eggs anymore. Um, but on the Faroe Islands, they do. And uh, I was told that the best egg for baking is that from the northern Fulmar. <laughs> Can you tell us what that is? It's true. It's you true. You dine They're out like on that, big, on that <laughs> nugget. The next question is up here on your left. Can you? Uh, Tell me the difference between uh, uh, baking a, a rye bread in oven or burying it in a, a volcano or volcanic ah. ash. Or yeah, so, so this is a reference to uh, a recipe that's in the book. You showed the pictures, right? Yes, that, yeah. maybe I did. <laughs> um, it was there, yeah. So if, if we say that the geographical and climatic uh, differences in the Nordic region, that's sort of the base layer of cultural diversity. Uh, and then uh, all of these other things that are cultural, uh, the differences that come from various other reasons, they are like a filter on top of that. And then we can see that the most important uh, filter 
that we placed on our food culture is uh, induced by whom occupied whom. <laughs> really? um, and in Sweden and Denmark, we've had the great tradition of very murderous kings throughout the years. Uh, Sweden is actually the country in the world that started the most wars <laughs> ever. We haven't done it in a long while, <laughs> but historically. How did the election uh, go? <laughs> so, and no. and the, the Nordic region is actually divided in two very distinctive cultural regions that depend on this. And the western part, uh, it has Danish influence because it was occupied by Den Denmark for the most part. Uh, if you look at Iceland, where this bread that you're referring to comes from, and the Greenland and the Faroe Islands, they're both, or all three of them are places that either is still Danish or were occupied for a long time. There are also all three island nations that didn't have any uh, grains growing on them. They didn't grow cereal crops at all, and mostly don't do that today either. And s cereal crops was introduced with the invaders, uh, with the Danes. So they brought their tradition of eating rye bread and baking rye loaves with them. And on Iceland, which is an island largely without trees, the predominant fuel would have been peat moss. And peat moss, you dig out of a peat bog, it's very laborious, you have to dig it out, it's like, it's wet, it has to be dried home and dried, and it's a, it's a very long process. Uh, so naturally, people would use that <laughs> primarily to heat their home. They wouldn't fire up a giant brick oven, you know, with a cubic meter of peat moss to, to bake a loaf of bread. But what they do have, though, is a lot of volcanic activity. So almost every older village in Iceland will have an area outside of the village um, where they have holes in the ground, one for each house. Traditionally, they were like reinforced with lattices of wood. These days, they usually take an old uh, drum from a, a washing machine <laughs> and they put it in the ground. <laughs> and then you go there in the evening with your bucket of the Danish rye dough bread. You put it in, you put a lid on, and you go back in the morning and you pull your steamed loaf out. No, no water, it's, a, it's just the, it, the heat of the volcanic yeah, heat yeah. soil. Yeah, it's around 100 degrees in there, Celsius. Are there any other traditions of sort of using found heat like that? Or you mentioned I, I don't think so. And, and there, I haven't seen many um, examples of steamed breads either, or anywhere in Europe, yeah. really. That's why. Oh. The next question is in the front on your mm -hmm. right. OK. I've Two quick questions. One is with respect to the JCC. I'm curious what your Christmas holiday food traditions are. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could just mention something about your passion for gardening. That was a really double double question. Um, so if we start with the... the, do, you, the do you work for Fiden, his publisher? Because that <laughs> sounds like two future books coming yeah. out. No, so the Nordic Christmas. Yeah. Now the Christmas, so in Sweden we are... We are really into Christmas, um, and we generally start preparing for our uh, big Christmas dinner, which is on Christmas Eve. We don't care about Christmas Day very much. Um, we start preparing that about now, <laughs> and then it's like a continuous flow of cooking for more than a month, you know? What's the first thing you... you is something cured, something... Yeah, it's like all of the herrings. You start yeah. now with doing those. Um, and and uh, if you... If you're sort of a little bit laid back and you make Christmas dinner in Sweden, you're looking at like 30 courses. <laughs> um, if you're really, really ambitious, like grandma type of ambitious, <laughs> then it can be 80 to 100 courses. What? And it's like a day of eating, you know? Wow. So we would usually, we would usually um, start at three in the afternoon, uh, or you start in the morning by having uh, Christmas rice porridge, of course, but um, then you start eating at three and you go through um, uh, herrings is the first service. So there are quite a, quite a few services. It's a hierarchy. It's, it's, it's a hierarchy. So herrings and uh, pickled fish uh, is the first, and then it's cold fish dishes, uh, and then it's uh, cold cuts. And then we usually take a break because in the afternoon, in Sweden on Christmas Eve. Everyone has a very specific tradition. We all watch one hour of old Walt Disney movies. <laughs> <laughs> and this is like, it's, 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 comple it's completely absurd, the whole thing. But it's the, uh, it's the program every year that has the highest viewership in Sweden. The whole it's, country. It's the highlights of all the movies? Yeah, it's like, like a five minute highlights of like all of the old classics. <laughs> all right. Yeah, and then, 
And, th and then after that, uh, we proceed with, uh, uh, then it's Lutefisk, which I skip because I don't like Lutefisk. I don't understand why anyone would do that to fish, you know? Uh, and then after that, it's uh, warm meat courses. Okay. And then after that, it's the Christmas ham. And then after that, it's the cheese. And then you'll have desserts. And then uh, later in the evening, you will have like all of the sweets as well. Okay, that was maybe a dozen. Ha yeah, but Tell all, about of the, all of like those are... Like 199 and 200. What's the 200? Yeah, yeah, but all of those dish, are like, uh, I mean, oh, you, many, you okay, have many, like many 12, so, 12 right. kinds of herring. It's like a fairly normal Oh, you're counting. Amount, okay, you know? all right. That's yeah, cheating a little bit. But. Six or eight warm meat dishes. Are you... And are there any other movie breaks or... <laughs> no, <laughs> no it's, just, it's just the one. Like yeah. no, no Disney fika later that you... Okay. All right, and then the gardening. <laughs> and then the gar oh, yeah. yeah, I'm really into gardening. It's uh, it's it's my great passion that I do a lot. I, um, I mean, at Five Week and we garden. We have we produce fifteen thousand kilos of vegetable uh, for the restaurant a year, which is about a third of what we use. Um, and that's not so much me doing that. There is uh, an employed head gardener and a whole bunch of other people working from the kitchens with that during the summer. But then I also garden at home, so I have. Um, like a couple of hundred square meters uh, garden and uh, 30 square meters of greenhouse. So I grow maybe a thousand kilos of vegetables at home. Where do you get your apples? Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I, very, I recently bought an apple orchard, actually, I know. in South Sweden, which how, is... Uh, how many trees? It's 10,000 apple trees, <laughs> 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 which is a whole other project. But it's a, it's a very beautiful place, so I'm very excited to <laughs> learn more about apples. Yeah. <laughs> Book three, or eight, or whatever we're on. We have time for one last question up here on your left. I'm just curious what your go-to comfort food is, whether baked good or otherwise. I mean, I really like, there's a recipe for chocolate oatmeal balls in the book, uh, which is just butter and oatmeal and sugar and cocoa powder, essentially. Not baked, right? No, or, not yeah. baked. And I mean, I remember eating that growing up, and I also remember that it very rarely makes it to the ball stage. It's like, <laughs> kind of, you know. After You're essentially you eat, eating raw cookie dough. Yeah, and you've eaten half of it, and then it's like, ah, you know. You <laughs> Just make one fall. <laughs> is, it a is it a holiday tradition? No, or? No. no. It's an everyday tradition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are we going to flash a number where people can make a reservation for Falvik in the year? No. No. <laughs> We're not going to do that. Right. <laughs> you can call Adam. He's, he's the, yeah. the reservations agent Definitely, for the yeah. Americas. <laughs> take, take. You have to take me. That's the only. Uh, well, thank you, Jordan. Thank you to yeah. the JCC. And thank you all for coming out. And thank, thank you, you so much, Jim. Yeah.